Good afternoon. Instead of the program schedule for today, I have the enormous honor of having as my guest a person who is not only the major operatic figure of our age, but one of its towering musicians, Maria Callas. Thank you for being with us, Miss Callas. I thank you for having me, Mr. Ardwin. <laughs> the details of your career are not only well known, they're virtually legendary at this point. So with your permission, what I would like to do this afternoon is not delve into the biography of this career, but rather investigate the thinking and musical force at work behind it. And I'd like to start with one word, the word technique. I think it is perhaps frequently misunderstood. Could you tell us what is your definition of technique and what function does it serve in terms of music? Well, uh, in my poor words, Technique should be uh, the equipment that one has in uh, being able to, uh, to interpret. Technique would be, for instance, like uh, one, one, one goes to school to learn how to read and write. And then after that, you uh, go into from lower grades, you go to the higher grades, and then high school, and then college. This is... Uh, what we call technique. You learn the solfege, you learn the harmonies, you learn music, you learn little by little how to read and write, and above that, then you uh, learn how to interpret and how to uh, resist certain, uh, well, of course, the vocal projection and uh, so many things, and how to be on stage, how to act. The little that the conservatory, or the lot that the conservatory, rather, excuse me, can teach you is giving you the technique just as... Uh, just as you go to school. But this technique itself is not to be learned just for its own sake, is it? Well, uh, you have to learn how to read and write to learn how to read. Exactly. So that is exactly it. Well, once a musician has acquired a technique... In other words, a musician, may I interrupt you, yes. a musician, as you say, singers, have to go through the same technique as instrumentists go. In other words, a violinist, a pianist, or any instrumentalist has to learn his uh, reading and writing. So we undergo the same exact treatment. Only instead of having an instrument, we have a vocal, we have vocal cords and we use our body and vocal cords. Well then, in terms of the music, do you think that the function of a singer and a singer's technique is of a different nature than that of an instrumentalist? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. It is exactly the same, the same approach, the same uh, m music, the same uh, uh, technique would be probably all those little notes, all the legatos, all the, uh, everything that comes with music is what you call technique. Now, technique also could be vocal, of course, is uh, how, when uh, an instrumentist know how to make, knows how to make his notes well with a proper intonation because uh, intonation is also a necessity for instrumentalists as with us don't you think i quite agree <clears throat> so then we have to learn how to cope with notes how to cope with soft notes loud notes the uh, mezzo fortes the uh, glissando the well these are details that of course the public does not know just a musician can know uh well it's long hard work I remember some time ago, a new singer came along on the horizon, and everyone was very excited and said about her, she has a marvelous trill. This seems rather strange to me, that someone should find it so exceptional that someone has a trill. I should think that uh, it would be an accepted thing, just as we would be very shocked if we found a violinist without a exactly. trill. Exactly. It is a necessity. This is the equipment that goes with our instrument in these operas that we perform, uh, you find these uh, technic, uh, technic things, uh, <laughs> little notes, trills, and, uh, uh, well, many uh, abelimenti, as they mm -hmm. call it. I wouldn't know really in English how they would call them. Embellishments. Yes. Uh, of uh, hundreds of, uh, of uh, I can't say, I don't know exactly whether there are hundreds, but I'm afraid so of qualities of uh, acciaccaturas and things. So how can we deal with these things unless we have them physically and technically, just as any instrumentalist? Well, we have to. Wouldn't you say that the purpose of mastering a trill, an acciaccatura, a or what have you, is 
not to have mastered this thing, but to use it, it for, is an expressive, a for an it, expressive purpose. First of all, this is the technique that yes. one ha must have. Then, of course, if a musician is uh, an honest musician and intends to become uh, someone to serve music, they should, of course, use all these ex uh, ways of expression, or rather embellishments, as expression, especially because we, would, we differentiate from instrumentalists. They have only the music, with or without orchestra mm -hmm. or piano, whatever it is. We have that plus music. In other words, words, we have to express ourselves with embellishments, without embellishments, with color, with notes, with every possible technical uh, necessity, and use that to the service of expression, because we cannot, of course, ignore the, f the, 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 the drama or the comedy, whatever thing we do, we deal with. So you see, we have a t twice as much responsibility on expression. I have always tried to look further into everything because it is in my nature. There must be a justification. It cannot be an embellishment just for the sake of, uh, of glamour or, shall we say, fireworks. There is usually always an, exp uh, an explanation. For, un for instance, you spoke about a trill, which in is most interesting. Trills are necessary and they have to be well performed because, in opera, I say, because, shall we take an example of, Please. of Trovatore, Verdi. Verdi usually used a lot of trills. Also, Donizetti will reach to that also. But uh, Verdi was really um, very fond of his trills, and I feel, and I found, that with words, he always used a trill if he wanted to express fear, happiness, joy, insecureness, so you cannot avoid that. In other words, you must have the trill to convey what the composer wanted, not what we want. So you see, a trill is necessary, a glissando is necessary, and all these little technical things are absolutely necessary for our equipment as a musician and an interpreter. Well, I must ask you, there has been a trend in recent years uh, to provide new embellishments and new mm. decorations for the operas of the bel canto to such a degree that at times the music itself, the vocal line, is not to be recognized. And I think that these are being done there with the misconception that this music is purely for vocal display, which I think is, well, that is nonsense. Not I think that is uh, it's not nonsense. Unfortunately, Mr. Ardoin, it is not serious. Mm -hmm. Because when th these great composers and by great I mean just uh, the, the ones I do consider the greatest are Donizetti, Bellini and Verdi, with of course uh, Rossini in the picture. <sighs> Absolutely were ill at the uh, idea and at the, with the reality of their contemporary mm -hmm. uh, singers spoiling the drama and the reason of their uh, composition. Also, because every one of them had a style of their own. I might bring you a small example of Bellini, the, um, the uh, shall we say, embellishment of Bellini, that different, 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 <laughs> dear me, how do you say it? Differentiation. Uh, uh, between Donizetti, Rossini, mm -hmm. and Bellini. He always used to use a natural, shall we say, a one-tone embellishment mm -hmm. to uh, the, the three or four notes embellishment that he had. Whereas in Rossini, you always find it a half a tone, and you do it automatically. Mm -hmm. Bellini has his, uh, for instance, in the Casta Diva, uh, first the flute plays, and then you sing it. And it is one tone, not half. And if he did mm -hmm. want a half a tone, he just put it there. Mm -hmm. So this is really something that he I'm sure was sick about the uh, if it was not respected. Well, how did you devise your various cadenzas for operas like Sonambula and Lucia? Well, uh, it is together with the, the, the maestro, together with your own good taste, uh, together with your uh, trying to do justice to the composer, his style, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, two or three heads put together also throughout the years, because you do change. I did change a lot, for instance, in Lucia. Uh, a dramatic soprano starting to do Lucia, 
again, because uh, may I remind you that uh, Lucia was the soprano that sang, or rather, shall we put it this way, the soprano that sang Lucia in, that, in those years, was the same soprano that sang Puritani, Sonambula, and Norma. Mm -hmm. So she was a, a, a dramatic soprano with coloratura. Uh, in fact, the Lucia is ro written rather in a low uh, tessitura. Therefore, uh, the cadenzas are, of course, a piacere, as they say, at will, at desire, but it is always at a piacere to the good taste of the, of the interpreter. And the interpreter must, of course, respect the, uh, the, uh, the nature of the, the, nature of the composer, not the music mm -hmm. itself. So we must do justice to this great man that we serve, because we are not great. We are servants of the great. Mm -hmm. So we must put truth. This is the way I feel. When they say frequently that, uh, well, Callas uh, was so exigent and she was so ambitious, she wanted, uh, it is not so. I am exigent and I am ambitious only for one thing. I must serve this great art mm -hmm. the best I can. By doing that, we of course are not great, but we hope to be able to serve the great. We interpret. So we have a double responsibility. We can make or spoil sublime music. So you see that it is very, very, it's a very difficult uh, job we have. Exactly. That is why I must be so uh, sometimes uh, harsh upon other people when they do not uh, do their duty well, do their uh, performing well. And it is not that I want anything for myself, because it would be so much easier for me to just, uh, yeah, of uh, you know, sort of sing the phrases, basta, and I have my good notes, and uh, mm -hmm. I can have my wonderful applause, but then... How have, have we served these great uh, people? Have we done our justice well? And then it makes work so much more beautiful. So uh, it gives us a reason of living and it gives you an everyday desire, of, a challenge of doing better every day. Because you're not an artist who's ever stood now, still. Lucia, exactly, no. But there's nobody that stays still. Have you stood still? People go on. They progress, I hope. Hopefully, yes. Hopefully that is our duty since we're born, to bring better things to life, or at least try. So, uh, uh, coming back to the Ruchi I was telling you, the cadences that I started off with were sort of traditional. Uh, rather good or bad, but it wasn't all that bad. Uh, I took the usual cadences and I managed with that. Little by little, I tried to eliminate things that are not extremely in good taste. Also because I myself became a better musician. Uh, sonambula, we have changed frequently because also you do change maestri. You mm -hmm. cannot sing with one all the time. It, that's bad and it's also because you sing all around the world. And then also you yourself uh, thought this two years ago or one year ago and today you change your mind, becoming a better musician or the many, many things, psychologically or etc. Well, in addition to this trend today to over-embellish music... I condemn sincerely. And I quite agree with you. There's also a trend that I would like to have your opinion on, and this is one of opening up so many cuts in an opera that uh, had not been heard before virtually, giving operas complete... And I wonder, how, what is your feeling about cutting an opera? I, uh, uh, I, I'm happy you asked me that because it's been bothering me frequently. There are some young musicians, more or less competent, that find it their duty to open these cuts. I have been brought up since a very early age, thank God, and uh, I'm lucky for that, into the bel canto uh, world. So it is none, not a merit of mine. I just happened to be born at a period where I just caught the last bit of these people that were very competent. Now, these great maestri have taught me ages ago that nothing should be repeated that much. Repetition is monotonous. Once you've put a point over, whether it's musical or uh, whatever phrasing, a beast of anything, in other words, the repetition of any, even the most beautiful melody, 
can the first time be a great success and the second automatically or nearly always automatically becomes uh, a less uh, a less uh, shall we say effective mm -hmm. if you do repeat out of necessity because out of good taste out of uh, uh, stage uh, necessities you know staging then you must do slight changes but slight I say mm -hmm. Uh, which I have done in Pirata, uh, in uh, certain cabalettas, as I say, of uh, Bellini also. But I have been taught that if you repeat, you must make slight changes in the variations of the melody, mm -hmm. or rather the... Uh, uh, the <laughs> uh, oh dear, how can I find the word? Not the melody, it's, it's really not changed. So it's like a it variation. Is the, the very, exactly, that is it. Because mm -hmm. it's usually never on the melody, but on the uh, cabaletta, as uh -huh, they call it. The conclusion of the theme or the uh, state of uh, uh, mind that the interpreter is stating, the state of soul or expression, uh, should not be repeated because it is ineffective. That I've been taught and insisted upon. Now I feel that if we have had such great celebrities and such humble and great men and really competent men, shall we say from Ste Sabata, Seraphine and downwards, not upwards unfortunately, I wish we did have upwards, or rather shall we say in our days, but from these men down to uh, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, they knew better than we did. So if they came to that conclusion when, in their years, people were more patient, they sat in the theater with much more patience. In other words, you could get a public to sit for five hours, six hours at a performance. Now, I don't think it proper. I, myself, being a musician, but trying always to be detached also as a musician because I'm an interpreter, I cannot sit through a performance for five hours in the same seat, taking in even the most gorgeous music. I think modern times have seen to that. You cannot force a person to sit around, uh, you know, in, in the same place for quite a while. Perhaps you had in mind Wagner. Yes, I have in mind Wagner, absolutely, because I think that Wagner is not all that easy yet to take in. Well, Especially it, for the young yeah. people that we must entice into music, because opera is a bit, shall we call, out of style. We have the disadvantage that opera is out of style. It's mm -hmm. old-fashioned. So when we objectively see that we have to deal with something really lovely, but you cannot bring youngsters into thinking that opera is modern, they are right, it is not. Because you cannot sing phrases like, I love you and I hate you, singing them for ten times. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, frankly, sort of ridiculous. Today of today. And probably it always was. Now, as it is not all that ridiculous, I hope, we must try to eliminate any boredom on anybody's heart or any ridiculous uh, attitude. By doing that, we have to slim up things, keep the necessary and uh, do justice to our interpreters, to our um, composers. That is what I feel. So by opening cuts, all we do is damage the composer, opera in itself, mm -hmm. and we tire people. I think... Uselessly. I think one of the unique qualities about your performances, or rather your singing, have been the tempos you have set or, ta or have taken, or the way you have seen music. Could you tell me how you decide on a tempo and uh, what makes you arrive at the ones that you have? Because uh, it, quite often the tempi you have chosen are, are frequently uh, oh, yes. a little slower than the norm. Oh, no. No, 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 John Ardwin. I, I'm afraid I, uh, I sort of do not take slow uh, tempi. Well, unless it's necessary. Well, it gives this impression at times, may I say? Oh, well, there's one more thing I've been taught in my younger days by these great musicians. There are tempis that you can take that are not all that slow, but so long as you take them with a slower attitude. Mm -hmm. I've heard that also said to the orchestras by these great maestri saying, gentlemen, let's keep this tempo, but please give it a more slow attitude. Or, or the same thing applies uh -huh. to the same tempo when I've heard this or I've been told, Take it the same way, but please give it a, a slightly quicker pace mm -hmm. or an agitation into mm -hmm. it. 
which has nothing to do with the actual tempo. I can take a very slow tempo and give it an agitating quality or color mm -hmm. or pace without budging at all from the rhythm or the tempo. So it's sort of a psychological thing. Yes, yeah. it's a sort of an animation, mm -hmm. and uh, well, these are the well, these are the wonderful things about music that you have never stopped to learn and to mm -hmm. give. But uh, I have also, for instance, I bring an example, Don Carlos, the Aria Veboli, which is not my part, of course, but I every now and then enjoy <laughs> <laughs> enjoy uh, singing other people's uh, parts. Uh, Eboli, the great Aria, I feel is taken usually too slow. Why, you will say. My answer to that is, her soul is so tormented, her agitation is so great, that I cannot see her relaxing so much to the extent of singing and terribly agitated and frustrated and uh, heart-breaking uh, piece with a very slow, comfortable pace. So really there I have overdone it in pace. Are you referring particularly quicker. to this sinner section? O don fatale. I know yes. the sinner section That's of it. That's right. Well, also the uh, the the end, but in the begin in the beginning especially, the uh, shall we say the uh, entering of the uh, eboli, her exclamation, mm -hmm. which is so it's an outburst. So you cannot make an outburst uh, such a, a strong outburst with a calm tempo. Mm -hmm. You cannot do it. I feel that I, now this is instinct. It is experience, and it is courage also, because you have to say, and I've been taught by my great uh, maestri of Once Upon a Time, that if we have to do justice to the composer by changing slightly what is written, because only, we have so very little written, mm -hmm. and we have to go by that. Now, if we have to go a little slower or a little quicker to do them justice, well, then never mind, let's do it. Well, do the, the words have a great part yes. in this? Yes, and the success of the performance yes. has a... Has a we have mm -hmm. to look at the result of the performance. It must be a success. Well, from Timpy, let's go to the question of the recitative, because I feel that, that no one has approached your handling of the recitative. It's a complete mastery, and I wish you could discuss for us for a few minutes what has gone into your understanding of the recitative and why? My this... recitative, I'll tell you, I have always been terribly intrigued mm -hmm. by recitative. There is a proportion always to be found because recitative would mean exactly speaking on notes. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time in, in the 19th century, in, when these operas were born, the people did not care about recitatives, as mm -hmm. you know at least from what we read, the composers did really go to a lot of trouble for these recitatives. They, uh, in, they created the, the music, every note, on every word. They used to sing it themselves. They used to create the recitative on the words. So therefore, they took a great pain and they gave it great importance. Now, uh, then the public did not care for it. They would just come in for the arias. Now, the people do care. They sit throughout a performance, and they care very much about anything we do. So therefore, we have a clear path to really uh, show our value, or the composer's value. Recitatives was shown to me clearly, especially by Maestro Serafin, and an occasion of Norma. He said, well, I, have, of course, had studied Norma since my early years at the Conservatoire, because uh, those are the things you learn at, uh, shall we say, school, which is our school, the, conserva the conservatory. I had studied this repertoire a long time ago, and for many years. Uh, when I auditioned for him in Norma, he said, well, that's fine, and he finally eventually found the place for me to debut because he needed a Norma, and it was Florence in 1948, 1948, December. When I went to Rome to coach with him, a few days, I sang the part through, and he says, that's fine. Now you do me one favor. Go home and talk these phrases over to yourself. In other words, sing them as though you were talking. Come with, back with the proportions you think are right, and then we'll discuss and see. But there is always a proportion and a rhythm, even in the talking, shall we say, recitative. It is hard to express in words, 
But, uh, and I don't think I put my, uh, my, my uh, way of thinking plainly. Is it but a in question? other words, it is, you have to talk. You have to talk with notes. Mm -hmm. And then these notes always have a rhythm because in every talk, even the way we talk now, there is a, you start lowly and then you increase the volume and then you end. Or you leave it halfway. Mm -hmm. It is exactly talking with the only difficulty that we do have notes and we do have a rhythm on stage because you, on stage also you cannot hold a pause for such a long time. There are certain, uh, well, I don't know, shall we say pauses, I don't know how to put them, certain empty, mm -hmm. emptiness exactly. between phrases, between recitatives mm -hmm. or between uh, phrases that you cannot overdo on stage, whereas in life you may. But there, the public that listens, there is a limit to any silence. Mm -hmm. So you have to go on no matter what. In other words, all this is very intangible. It is very complicated and yet so simple. You have to do your own proportion and you have to work yourself every day to it. And it changes from performance to performance, from one minute to the other, from what comes before. From what you have done before, from what ha things, what uh, has happened before, from your colleagues, so you see, it's a very, uh, it's a sort of a reflex thing that happens. Of course, you learn it at home, you keep on studying at home, and then once you're on the performance, in the performance, it is to your good taste and to developments of every second that happens during the performance. Well, you touched upon Norma a moment ago, yes. which, of course, is the role that, if, if any had to be chosen, it's probably the role you most completely own as your own. And yes, I indeed. wonder if you could tell me, I sense a difference between the Norma, say, of Mexico City in 1950 and the ones in Paris in 1965. There was, of course, nothing wrong with the one in 1950 in Mexico. It's quite a brilliant achievement. But the one in 1965 went so much deeper into the heart of the score than you had before. What sort of thinking took place in your experience during these two extremes of Norma? How, how many years ago was that Mexico performance? That would be Could you remember? 18 years ago. Well, how old was I 18 years ago? Uh, if I'm 44 now, take out 18. Uh -huh. How many things have gone, have happened to me in life since 18 years ago? How much have I studied? How many operas have, have been performed since then? What have I learned from the consequent operas and that have uh, served as a lesson to this opera? Many things have happened, so therefore I have changed not much, because the change is not all that much. I think a person cannot change that much, and music cannot change that much. No, it's but an incredible refinement. It is a refinement. Yes. Is it, a, it is a conscientiousness of a musician that you cannot take care of, because you see, when you sing, when you... Uh, uh, you have to give yourself time to grow up. <laughs> so what I could not do 18 years ago, I can do now. What I did better 18 years ago, because I was young, I might not do now. So it is always I give mm -hmm. and have to give. In other words, I have improved other things. I might have spoiled other things, because also when you do improve, well, then you... Uh, the more a musician grows, the less he makes concessions. Therefore, the less he can keep a phrase, uh, shall we say, uh, accommodating for him, the less breathing, the longer breathing and resting paces you can have. So the more you don't give in, the more tired you get mm -hmm. during certain phrases. Whereas when you, you were younger, your main uh, preoccupation was, well, I've got this high note and I've got that difficult phrase. Let's mm -hmm. uh, start a, a sort of forget the difficulties of before and, uh, uh, you know, avoid tiring ourselves before so as we'll have this effect better. Well, the older you grow, the less you want to give in to feebleness. But unfortunately, what you do improve here, you might spoil there. Mm -hmm. And these are such intangible things. No matter how much technique you have, each performance is different. Because the, the, the human being is made of chemistry, of uh, a human throat, of a mind, of reflexes, of uh, 
God knows what. I mean, we are, after all, very human. And it is not an instrument that you can play with. I mean, touch. It is really intangible. Of course. This brings us back to, once again, it's the question of having a first-class technique that allows you the spontaneity to oh, change. Yes. But this technique must be learned in your very, very early years. In other words, I find that a musician or a singer, whatever he does, singer or an instrumentalist, must start very, very young in life, as we did then. Mm -hmm. I started very terribly young, so I had made all my technique and experience years and years ago, during my conservatory years. Of course, I was singing also then, on stage. So you see, I started 13 years old, actually, mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, all the, the surprises that I could have, and I can deal with any, I'm proud that, to say that I can deal with any difficult, vocal difficult, difficulty and uh, technical difficulty, because I don't have many surprises now. Because I learned during my early days all the possibilities. That is why you study. You were speaking the other day about the immense amount of literature which you had sung oh, in yes. Greece in your student days. I believe you recalled the Pergolesi and the Rossini Stabat Mater. Oh, yes. And uh, many Arie Antiche and many, Lieder. Many. I've done everything I could possibly put my hands on. More or less well, but one helps the other. If you do uh, Purcell, it helps... Uh, I don't know what other composer. If you do Verdi, it helps Bellini, vice versa. Donizetti, Rossini. I think that every music gives you more uh, maturity and more uh, inner views. Well, you've sung such a phenomenal range of material. Yes. Uh, from Sonambula and Lucia to Kundry and Brunhilde. Oh, I've even sung Giordano. Giordano. It is not extremely, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, sort of considered the best composers of, uh, of any time. And yet, that also has served. Well, did you sing Wagner? Oh, yes. Like, I know you sang Wagner, <laughs> but did you sing it in... In a, di in a manner different from the Italian way of singing. Is there special demands that Wagner made upon you that Verdi uh, did not? Oh, no. Wagner is so easier. Than Verdi? Oh, uh, indeed. Tell Be us how. Well, I'll tell you why and how. Wagner, uh, where he's clean cut from the beginning, there's no doubt where it will, be in, where it will begin and where it will end. Brunhilde. She is a hero from the beginning, and there is no unsta instability, instability no delineation about it. of character. None whatsoever. Uh -huh. She does not have technical uh, difficulties. She does not have all these uh, abelimenti that I spoke of before. She is one solid rock, more or less. <laughs> so you see, the risk is much less. She is not uncovered vocally. In other words, the orchestration is so powerful under her that she feels very secure she i say uh, soprano tristan and isolde for instance isolde i found very easy why because she's supported by a tremendous orchestra the notes are not extremely difficult even the high notes are not all that many not nearly as norma or even in mm -hmm. verdi mm -hmm. And the technical uh, difficulties are not there. The abelimenti, the fioriture, they're not there. They're very little to it. And Have also, you ever thought of that? Uh, no, I, I quite agree with you. And it also occurs to me that Isolde actually sings less music than does Norma. Exactly. Uh -huh. So it is really, believe me, not as difficult as the bel canto. And by bel canto, I mean not the beautiful singing which bel canto is supposedly known. The bel canto does not mean beautiful singing. It means an equipment, or other, in other words, what we were talking about. The technique of bel canto is the uh, Rossini, Bellini, Donizetti, and all the composers of then. But, excuse me, it is the same attitude of Mozart, Beethoven, or all the other composers. The same exact approach, with the same difficult uh, technic, uh, technical difficulties as our uh, colleagues instrumentalists. Mm -hmm. So a musician is a musician. A musician is a musician, period, and there is no excuse. Now I repeat, I don't want to appear presumptuous, uh, Mr. Arduin, but when singers come to audition or to sing, saying 
uh, rather other people saying, well, the, uh, the, she doesn't have this, or he doesn't have this, and he doesn't have that, and he doesn't have the trill, and he can't do the chakatura, and he can't do the abelimenti. Well, then you cannot sing, period, because in these books, shall we say, the partition of composers like Verdi and Down have technical actual things written to be performed and must be performed, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. So how will you get out of a trill? How will you get out of scales when they're written there looking you in the face? Exactly. You cannot cheat. However, I hate to tell you, it is done. Well, it is not yes. supposed to be, of because not. once upon a time you would be considered inadept, mm -hmm. and you would have to sing little roles, smaller mm -hmm. roles. Do you think it is not enough to have a beautiful voice, John Ardwin. Of course. There's not nothing, that there's nothing there's wrong nothing with a duller, beautiful voice. Though. No, exactly, because a beautiful voice, what does that mean? When you have to interpret a role, you have to have thousands of colors during the performance to portray the words you do. Happiness, joy, unhappiness, sorrow, fear. How can you have just a beautiful voice, period? You must put that to the service of expression. So therefore, even if you have to sing harshly sometimes, which I frequently have done, shrill, it is a necessity of expression. It is written there. You have to respect the words and you have to do it, even if people will not understand. But on the long road, they will, because you have to persuade people of what you're doing. We are not doing anything special. We are doing what we're supposed to. It's written there. We have to. Well, from this standpoint, with your permission, I would like to take one of your most famous recorded scenes, the sleepwalking scene from Macbeth. And I'd like to discuss it with you, <laughs> section by section, if we might, and have you take the things which we have discussed this afternoon, questions of coloration, expression, tempo, rubati, and so forth, and show us how you applied them to this particular scene, which I think is one of the, your most extraordinary recordings. Okay. Could you tell us something, give us a little background and set the stage first for this particular scene of Lady Macbeth in the uh, third uh, act of Verdi's yes. opera? I'll try my best, uh, Mr. Ardon, but I would like to say something very amusing. Uh, when I recorded uh, this aria, I recorded uh, quite a few Verdi arias then at the same time. And uh, I'll never forget this uh, incident. Uh, I was in quite good voice then, that day, because you know we have our ups and downs. Uh, sometimes you sing well, sometimes you don't for no reason at all, more or less. Uh, I was kind of very proud as soon as I stepped down to listen to the playback. And I told uh, our then artistic director, uh, Walter Legg, uh, I said, well, Walter, that was, I think, some good singing, don't you think? He says, oh, extraordinary. And he says, well, you'll hear it now, and then you'll understand that you'll have to redo it the proper way. I was a bit, you know, shocked. I said, what do you mean by that? Well, he says, uh, you'll listen to it, you'll see. In fact, I did listen. It was astonish astonishing as perfection of vocal, which is what we were talking about. It yes. was perfect vocally. Nobody could say anything about it. But the main idea of this... Uh, sleepwalking scene was not uh, was not underlined in other words she is in a nightmare sleepwalking stage she has to convey all these odd thoughts that go through her head evil fearsome uh, terrifying so I had made a masterpiece of vocal singing but I had not done my duty as an interpreter Ah, uh, you hadn't captured what you felt. I had to mood. break it down in many, many phrases. Mm hmm I immediately, as soon as I heard it, I said, well, you're right, now I understand. And I went and performed it. You broke it down into phrases because you yes. felt that her nature was such No, that I did not feel. You knew. I knew <laughs> that there are phrases that you have to... Uh, not phrases. Mental thoughts. Yeah. In this sleepwalking scene, she has, I can't remember, are there five or six? Well, we'll see it through if, if we go through the uh, piece now. I think she must have at least six mental act, uh, thoughts that come mm -hmm. to her, so there's one completely different from the other. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think it's a sort of a mad scene mm -hmm. while she's sleeping, you know. She's speaking out loud. 
Could you quickly uh, tell our listeners why Lady Macbeth has reached this state of mind? Well, uh, this state of mind, shall we say, is conscience. She has uh, helped her husband into a very evil uh, event. She, for her vanity, has persuaded her husband to kill the king so he would become king. And now very she ambitious has ambitious lady. Conscience. And uh, disaster has come because her husband could not stand it and went uh, stark mad, as history uh, said. So uh, she finally copes with madness in this sleepwalking scene. What and a mad scene? person, of course, has thoughts, one thought into the other, with no continuity. They're completely discontinued. So for one minute she's talking about the blood stains on her hand that terrify her and she can never get them cleaned. And on the other hand, right away she says, well, come now, you must get ready for, to receive these people. Everything is fine. Then all of a sudden she'd come back to another mental attitude. In other words, she is uh, out of her mind. So you cannot bring it through one line from beginning to the end. You have to break it in to every thought. In other words, mm -hmm. the words of thought. The words of the, that the composer has put there have thought it out for you before. What has Verdi given you? What sort of directions here for this first section? Well, shall we say for the first section, it starts with saying that there are stains on my hands. Go away. Damn them. One, two. This is the time. Why are you trembling? Are you not going in? Now, have you seen a difference there? Already we have two changes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. One stain with the other. Why don't they go away? And she says, one stain, two stains. All of a sudden, she comes out saying, this is the hour. Let's get ready. So there is a break. Mm -hmm. You get such an, an earthly quality on the, on the words, earthly. uno, due, that like, like it it's coming earthly. from the back of your mind. It is. That's exactly it. Uh -huh. That's what I had to convey in this piece. Let's play this first phrase now. Yes. What happens now after this first phrase, musically? Well, after this, while the music goes on always, you see, because we have no time to sit down and, you know, take our time, as in theater, the pauses don't exist. Music goes on, so you have to deal with these mental states with the music going on. She says, una, due, and then, ye questa l'ora, get ready. Why, are you afraid to go in, she says? You, a great warrior, how could you be so... Uh, codardo would mean a coward. Uh -huh. Oh, shame on you. Come quickly. And then all of a sudden she says, who could ever imagine that in that old man there could be so much blood? So you see the difference. This is being stark mad. Mm -hmm. How could you convey this all in one beautiful quality? You cannot. And vocally, you cannot absolutely. As they will hear right now, vocally, the Even difference speaking, between the two as is I speak extraordinary. Very badly. I yes. speak very badly. It's not my, uh, uh, my forte. <laughs> but even speaking, you cannot convey, God, how much blood with, oh, how could you be such a coward, mm -hmm. a great warrior. There you are. Her mind is wondering. Her mind is wondering one minute, 
terrified the other, commanding the other. So you have to convey that in voice, also, especially. And on the word imaginar, how has Verdi helped you convey this? There are tenth notes, I think you call them. They oh, are accented. Uh, 16th notes. Yeah. 16th notes, pardon. And they are uh, accentuated. Each one forza. In other words, mm. sforzando, which mm -hmm. means touching. So therefore, they are not cadenzas because they are rhythmic, accented, which means terra. Could not imagine. So, uh, like something heavy breathing. Ter terrifying, yes. though with no breathing. So it is quite clear if a musician sees it, he would understand. I wish the public would. But I'm sure by playing and repeatedly playing, one would get the idea. It's a sort of an obsessive uh, quality saying nobody could imagine such a thing. In fact, well, it's, I say, difficult to explain. And Verdi really, at this point, divides the scene into two completely, halves. Completely, yes. completely. Let's, well, hear the, let's hear this yes. next section now before we go any further. After this section, Lady Macbeth's thoughts are interrupted by the doctor, who says, Que parlo? Yes, well, that she, uh, she cannot hear. She does, she's not aware of the, the, the no, medical. she is completely mm -hmm. sleepwalking and cannot mm -hmm. understand anything and does not look at anything, but has her thoughts that are going on in her mind. She has very many changes of thoughts, but very brusque, mm -hmm. as you see. And then again, she comes back to the same obsessiveness of, I cannot clean the... The blood on my hands. I can never clean it. Nobody will ever clean it. Why do you suppose at this point Verdi marked this section di sangue umano as, as triple piano? Because it should be nearly husky in the quality, nearly eerie. Uh -huh. It's terror. And then such an Im immense change which he marks con forza after that. Yes, about... because where she says di sangue umano is terror. She doesn't want anybody to hear her. Uh, it's just so much fear. Has it ever happened that sometimes you're so terrified that you don't, you nearly whisper, you're afraid that people will hear. And then the Arabia, Arabia intera, in other words, the whole of Arabia will never be able to clean all these. Uh, this is an abnormal state of mind and of feelings. And again, here she withdraws. Again, yes, because it's, a, it's an outburst. And then again, she's quiet. Because it's fear. Every what? now and then you have the outbursts. Mm -hmm. And then, but there are outbursts that you have to always rebuild in the musical phrases, which is extremely difficult also. Because it is always an outburst that is within the possible capture of the ear. In other words, not too loud, so they won't erase the pianos. It has to grow in. Another technical thing that I wish the public could understand. It should not be too loud. It should not be after too soft. Let's play this section right now.
Right after this section, when she's worrying about cleaning her hands again, says there's no balsam that will do it, yes. there's an immediate change in the orchestra. You get an agitato almost yes. in the strings. Because she sees that probably in her uh, that, that it's impossible. mind... No, yes, she's, she's over, uh, already forgotten that in her mind. Another thought has come and is telling her husband, come now, you must get ready. You must get dressed. They are waiting for you. Nobody, uh, no dead comes alive, so don't be afraid. Uh, so you see, these thoughts come and go mm -hmm. with such abrupt changes. And then the section when she urges Macbeth to bed is so lyrical all of a sudden, it has more yes. warmth than any other spot in the yes, scene. Yes, because she's a very persuasive woman, <laughs> and she has such strength over her husband, to my idea, or at least from what we go by, by words and uh, uh, history or whatever it is, that, that she must not have been a terribly ugly woman. She must have really been very fascinating for her husband to be able to do with him as she pleased. So they were completely tied together, and that is why she says after, come, let's go, don't be afraid, let's go to bed, come calm yourself. It is a woman that is absolutely together with her husband, and they are both very ambitious. What, uh, from where is derived this idea of, of Bat al -Kun, In her star craving mindness, mm -hmm. She has these terrors of hearing, which in fact in the first act she has heard knockings on the doors mm -hmm. with her husband. This is the recall. She mm -hmm. recollects the, the, the knocking on the door of, uh, the, uh, of the people coming and saying, God, we found uh, him dead. We found the king dead. Uh, so she the recollects. Act. These uh -huh. are all recollections of the past. Mm -hmm. All this sleepwalking scene is a recollection of the very beginning of the opera and throughout the opera. So you see, actually it is a, a, a mad scene mm -hmm. in a sleepwalking form. So how can a mad woman with all crazy thoughts jumping from one to the other be conveyed in a straight, lovely, kind of a even paced vocal uh, piece? It cannot. Therefore I had to break it in all these phrases. And Verdi certainly aids you here with all the diminuendos oh. and crescendos and, exactly. and alagandos and everything that's marked. That is why it's also so terribly necessary to have a great conductor with you, because you cannot do this one-handed. You have to have a great conductor who will help you with his orchestra, a great uh, stage director who can help you on stage, and your mm -hmm. colleagues that will help you also on stage, because you can have, have worked so hard to create a, uh, an atmosphere, and all of a sudden, one colleague of yours comes out mm -hmm. singing in the bad uh, vocal uh, tone and spoils all this atmosphere, so you have to work again to recreate it. It is a teamwork, a teamwork of, uh, of, uh, uh, of seriousness, of uh, great science, of great faith, great sacrifice, and therefore... Uh, <laughs> We depend one on, other, on the other for the success of the performance. What do you think Verdi had in mind with that final top D flat, marked Fil de Voce? Well, wouldn't I like to have asked him that if you were alive? Because <laughs> <laughs> it is so difficult. Yes. Well, it's, it's off stage, isn't it? Yes, it's off stage, but you must remember also that these composers had to deal and had to serve the uh, singers with... Uh, technical difficulties and vocal effects. So uh, every now and then you have a vocal effect that you have to perform. Mm -hmm. That today probably you wouldn't have done because music is so much more refined. Yet this one moment does not seem apart from the rest of the scene. It's almost like a cap. Maybe. I wonder. Has it bothered you? Yes, I don't mean, it, yes, I don't mean vocally, but I mean dramatically. Yes, it has. Uh -huh. Yes, it has. Yes, it has, because you've been in the middle of the voice all the time, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden you reach up high. Mm -hmm. There is not much just justification. Uh, you caught me uh, uh, sort of uh, <laughs> off guard, <laughs> off guard <laughs> here, and I can't answer. But it has troubled me, and uh, I was wondering whether it really was necessary. But I suppose he had his good reasons. They know better than, I, than us. Let's listen now, if we may, to the final section of the sleepwalking scene from Macbeth.
It is so difficult, you see, to conclude this, uh, this lovely interview, Mr. Arduin, who that does make so much sense and pleases me so much. Uh, it is difficult to explain to the public what we have to do to perform. It is difficult because it is a whole science. It has taken years of sacrifice, of study, of work. We cannot really pretend that the public understands, because you will have to learn that. If we could, it would be so much easier. And the music also would, uh, rather singing, would be helped so much. They themselves, if they were more prepared when they go to the performance, uh, they would uh, understand and be able to justify so many, so, uh, well, maybe even stupid things that they think we do, because they are not prepared. So really, if we could uh, teach the public sometimes all these technical difficulties or all the way we work, even if we could have lessons, uh, it, would be, it would be most interesting and most profitable for them too. They would love opera much more and they would stand also opera better and stand the good things and the bad things and have less patience or more patience and love us a little more too. Well, I know that anyone who has heard our visit this afternoon has certainly profited from it. <laughs> and I hope so. For myself, I must say that it's been one of the great joys of my life to realize that the person I've admired so as an artist is as beautiful as a human being. Thank you so and much. Thank you right. for being with us this thank afternoon. Thank you for understanding me so much and giving me the possibility of expressing a few phrases, uh, though they are very badly expressed. I think they're rather <laughs> brilliantly expressed. They're concise and to the point, just as your artistry is. Thank you. <laughs>